welcome to Life and Inside Job. In this episode, Kat Ferrance, who's the founder of the phenomenally successful Movement for Modern Life, also known as the Netflix of yoga, <laughs> explores with me the ethics of the yoga business and how the spiritual and material, i.e. the money aspects of yoga, get along together, or possibly they don't. Kat is totally honest and warm and curious as we chew on lots of juicy questions like, can you ever make any money out of being a yoga teacher? Is burnout inevitable? Is it ethical to train more and more teachers in an already saturated market? And what about gyms and underpaying teachers? Loads of really interesting questions. I think that this conversation should be listened to by anyone who is considering taking a yoga teacher training. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are both connected to the yoga world, but kind of slightly apart. So people often think that I'm, I'm a yoga teacher, but I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm a keen student. I, I'm a yoga nidra guide, but um, I'm not a teacher. I just, I'm just fascinated by the thing. And then you, you run um, Movement for Modern Life. Uh, yeah, I do. And people often think that I'm a yoga teacher too. We have mm. this in common. And I am. I'm a trained teacher, but I don't teach. And mm. that means that I'm not really a teacher. <laughs> mm. I discovered it quite a early stage in my not teaching career that I wasn't meant to be a teacher. And that was sort of, for me, part of the reason why I set up Movement for Modern Life, because I knew how rubbish I was. <laughs> Not everyone's meant to be a yoga teacher. And I think there's this, this sort of progression, isn't there, Kate? That's like, okay, if you've been practicing yoga for a certain amount of time, you do some teacher trainings, you do some learnings, and it's like, now you go off and teach. Well, yeah. Not everybody is meant to teach. Mm. Yeah, I think that the work of a teacher is really different to being the work of a lifelong student. Mm. And the best teachers are lifelong students, shouldn't necessarily impose themselves on students to become teachers. Yeah, uh, yeah, I can't think of anything worse than teaching. Very often I've, <laughs> I've taken what I love and made it into a business and turned it into a complete misery. <laughs> Follow your passion is, is not always great advice. It's not always great advice. Yeah, that's what happened to me because I was passionate about, was, <laughs> I am passionate about yoga and the real benefits, the real benefits that we can all get from a great sustainable practice with a really great teacher. And that is my passion. But yeah, turning it into your life mm. and into i guess air quotes business oh yeah so business. let's grab this monster by the horns and talk money 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 oh money 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 and how the hell does your average person who's done a 200 hour training mm. earn a living i know people who just completely burn out running from gym to venue to this to that to the private and they're in pieces yeah, yeah. And that's kind of a very normal experience now for most, I would say new teachers, but most teachers. Mm. To be honest, it's really hard to be a viable yoga teacher now. There's a lot of yoga teachers, there's a lot of choice. There's um, people who devalue it as a practice, I think, which kind of makes for a race to the bottom. There are loads of folks. Can you, what do you mean to value it? Well, do you value it monetarily? Okay. So they don't pay teachers. It's very common for studios to hardly pay teachers and gyms hardly pay teachers. And there's this kind of thought in the sort of ether out there that yoga should be free. Mm. It's a, that's a thing. People kind of think that yoga should be free. And, um, I think what this all comes to is 
value and worth, our own worth, and how much we value each other and ourselves, because yoga is ultimately, it's teaching us about ourselves. Hmm. It's interesting. It's a conundrum. And I think for current yoga teachers, it's also just, there are so many yoga teachers and there are so many places who do not pay yoga teachers. They just sort well, of, of, of I, spoke, I spoke to Angela Farmer, my heroine, um, the other week, which was delicious. And one of the things she said was, um, if I had made this into, if I had made my work into a training and I had a training school, I would have been really rich. <laughs> she would have. That's how to make money these days. But I would have had to have, and she said something like, um, been a policeman or it would have gone rigid because then you have to police it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, this proliferation of, of teachers is because, <laughs> because it's hard to make money. So, and it's easier to make money by training people. It is. That's, that's right. And that's kind of how most yoga organizations make money is in trainings, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's worth thinking about for people who are thinking about becoming a teacher is that there's a lot of choice, but also as a livelihood, it's a tough one. It's hard, isn't it? Mm, it is hard. You said earlier that there's this feeling that yoga should be free. Well, it, it is. You just tune into YouTube. Yeah, right. There's Yoga with Adrian with 10,000 yeah. videos for... Who? <laughs> excuse me i must have said a, that was a, um, a belch but yeah you're absolutely right there are loads of teachers out there for free on youtube and it's like if you're willing to sift through the crap you might well hap upon a practice that suits your body and suits you at that time mm. And it's just like that question. I think it comes down to that yoga principle of discernment, don't you think, Kate? Mm. It's like you, we all need to be a little bit discerning how we spend our precious resources, which mm. are our time is our number one resource on this planet, right? How do we spend our time? Mm. Do we want to spend our time with something that is... Um, I, I couldn't comment, actually, <laughs> which, which is something which may or may not be for our very best health and well-being. Because mm. I think there are ways of optimizing, aren't there? It's like there are things that we can do mm. and teachers who we can practice with who will make us feel very magical and amazing as the practice does. Mm. And there are sort of and I put myself in this category, there are teachers who will make you feel that you've been cheer led up dog, down dog, chaturanga, you know, like, what's that? You're just saying names. Mm. That's not teaching yoga. That's just name calling. <laughs> so how, how does um, online yoga complement in-person yoga? Because you're, what you're describing mm. there is that is a relationship is that what, what the way I think about it is the mm. teacher's relationship with their body mm -hmm. and how they relate to themselves. And that's what they're teaching. Yeah, that's right? right. That's right. Because you can feel somebody who is curious and kind and respectful of their mm. body. You can feel that and you can see it, right? And teaching and from their own practice. Mm. Sorry. I think, I think that's the key thing because there are so many teachers and people who I come across who are like, I don't have any time to practice because I'm teaching, but how can you teach if you don't have a practice? Like, mm -hmm. I think the best teachers and the hallmark of a teacher is teaching from your practice. Because mm -hmm. you're right, you have to learn the things, like you have to experience it. You can't read it from a book. You have to jump in the water and swim. Mm -hmm. So how, how, do, mm -hmm. how do you, how is that brought to an online class? Yeah, and that's it. In a way, it's an interesting way of putting it because I would sort of think the other way around also accounts. How could it not? Because in one way, it's a teacher just teaching, whether it's teaching to a virtual audience or teaching to a real person. 
unless you're doing a one-to-one, -one, which I think are actually absolutely brilliant, where you get feedback from that student right there and then, yes, this, no, that, this feels this, this feels that. I would say that teaching in a class, even of 15, 10 to 15 people, how can you know? How can you really teach to those different bodies? I mean, good teachers will find ways, but I'm slightly, I'm slightly in a conundrum, to be honest, about teaching classes because it's like, okay, I go to the 7.30 class because that's a class that suits me and it's with a teacher that suits me. But then if I'm on my period, or if I'm feeling funny, or if I'm feeling a little bit angry, or if just uh, I'm feeling a little bit stiffer than normal, or maybe I'm feeling a bit more energetic than normal. Well, I'm still going to that 7.30 class. And how, just because the teacher is sort of able to teach from their wisdom at that moment, how does that necessarily translate to your body's needs right there at that moment? Um, and I suppose this is why I see what, uh, the way that I perceive movement for modern life and like my little online yoga revolution is it is pretty radical because it's asking us before we, before we step on the mat, before we say, yeah, 7.30, that's my allotted yoga time. Before we do that to say, now what? Now let's really listen. Let's listen inside. What is it that I need? What's actually going to be beneficial for me? And it might not be the thing that the teacher feels like teaching at that time. So that's why it's like, um, yeah, okay, today I'm feeling and you know, all the things you might be feeling. So what practice is suitable for that? So if I'm going to move into a different feeling state, how can I make that practice bespoke to me? Mm. That's a very different way around to say a very traditional Ashtanga school, which is where I started off with, mm. which is like, this is the practice. This is the discipline. The discipline is roll out your mat at 4.30 a.m. every morning. You do that practice. If you're on a moon day, don't do the practice. Do the practice the day after the moon day. This is the practice. There are no adjustments. There are no props because that's the practice. In a way, that discipline is very suitable for us roving minds of this sort of modern world. And a lot of us need that kind of sense of discipline because we don't have the discipline to look within ourselves and really say, who am I right now? What serves me? And you know what? Maybe it does serve you to do a 4.30 a.m. practice that's exactly the same every day. And we are different humans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm, but I'm not that human. So I guess I've created a movement for modern life for humans like me <laughs> who are not who do not want that prescriptive thing and who want to look inwards and who think that a deep level of inquiry is important. And that makes it safer. I think, I think it makes it a safer experience if you're really listening to yourself. Mm. And I think that, I bet that's got to be the same in a live class as well, hasn't it? You've got to not be carried away by that person who's on the mat next to you doing a fancier shape than you are. <laughs> well, the, th the thing, one, one of the things that I, I, we, I wanted to bring to this conversation was about how teachers of all kinds have authority. And that is, they have much more authority than we think. So I've witnessed in, you know, in a live, in a, in a real life class, the teacher saying, oh, I saw this film the other day, it was great. And all the students rush around and go, oh, what was it? What was it? You know, that your opinions are absorbed. The, the students are more permeable. And even the resistant cross arse faced students like me, who go, fuck you, I'm not going to watch the film, are still more permeable because I'm still having a reaction. Of course you are. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's that interesting thing about authority and caring about our teachers. Yeah. What is it with that? Right. We really care what our teachers think. Mm. And we, 
we put them on a pedestal somehow. And of course, because that's the whole point, teacher student, it's a hierarchical relationship. It is, oh yeah, I, ah, yeah, okay, that's it. So it's important to acknowledge that even in our, because I'm, I'm with you on the, the quiet, curious, inquiring practice, that's how I like to be. But even in that place, there is hierarchy and it needs to be named. Absolutely. Absolutely. There, there, there absolutely is this hierarchy between yoga teachers, even. There's hierarchy teacher to student. There's teachers who are known as teachers' teachers. There's and oh god, yes, yes, it's yeah, insidious. Right. That's right. Yeah. The hierarchy in the in yoga is massive. And I think the trouble with it is it distances us, it distances us from our bodies. Because we feel that somebody else knows our body better than we do. Mm. Maybe it's a bit like a doctor type relationship. You go along to a doctor and you're like, well, you know, because you've done the medical training, but we're the ones who inhabit our bodies 24 bloody seven. We know what's going on. We can feel it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, as I mentioned to you earlier, I've, I've had this experience recently where I was, I could see wonky stuff going on in a class over a period of time, and I mm. kind of excused it. And in the end, I was, well, shut on, really. <laughs> oh, shit. And I, my, and I was talking with a uh, group of people in a similar, with similar experiences, and what all of us felt the one there were many commonalities but one of them was that we felt stupid mm. we all felt only only we all felt stupid for not having seen the signs and i i think this is because it's of the shame. hierarchy it's, it's the shame. a bloody yeah. shame it's society shaming us Urgh. yeah it's horrendous yeah it's the hierarchy and that happens in yoga all the time all the time so I've how do that. we how do we undo this I think naming it is important, isn't it? We've all got to name it. And it's hard to, because I've had that experience in a class I went to ages ago. And I never went up to the studio manager and said, that teacher, he actually bullied me. He shamed me publicly in the class, pointed out what I was doing as wrong, and then made an adjustment that was inappropriate. And I never said anything. And that teacher is off, off he travels. He's still doing very, very well. And there are many students who are okay. Not, they, they're not okay with it because I don't think anyone's okay with it. But it's kind of an expected, I think, yeah, what do we do about that? We've got to name it is the first thing. Well, Uma is, doing, Uma is doing big things with her. Yeah. The only Shakti movement. Yeah, she is. There are teachers um, who are really good at naming and speaking truth to power. Uma is one. Norman Blair is another. I rather love Norman. I rather love <laughs> Norman. <laughs> Norman's great. He's just brilliant. He is to me, and it sounds silly, like he is to me the ideal yogi. But Can you just um, say um, about what he teaches, please? Because people oh, so Norman, Norman is an Ashtanga and a yin yoga teacher. And he's one of these people who's been teaching yoga for decades and decades and decades. And he teaches in London and he's very, he's now set up the yoga union, which is people speaking truth to the low teacher pay. And he is really vociferous in backing up teachers who are bullied, who are underpaid, teachers who are going through shitty experiences, and also students who are. Mm -hmm. He is, um, he's of course a teacher on movement for modern life, but his mm -hmm. wisdom and his speaking truth to power and his unapologetic, um, he was one of the pe first people who outed what a very big yoga studio in London was underpaying and the pay differentials and you know he wasn't afraid of the backlash it's that being unafraid and i think that's what all of us as students need a little bit more of we need just more of that backbone 
Like, come on, what would it matter if we spoke truth to power? Why are we also, especially maybe us English folks, we're a little bit like, no, 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 don't worry about me. I'll just. Oh, no, well, actually, fine. actually, I have. I, I. This is. This has been very much in my mind. Yeah. And in my experience, mm. in the last six months or so, and mm. I think it's to do with our need to belong. You know, that basic human need to belong and to feel safe. Yeah, I think that's it. And it. In, we come to a yoga practice, we, most many people come to a yoga practice because the world is turbulent and challenging and as a place to seek refuge, we come to a practice so that we can seek refuge. So I think you're right, actually, you're spot on here, Kate. It is that thing about safety. And it's like if within the very place that we seek refuge, we find a place which isn't safe and isn't safe, there are so many ways that a yoga teacher can be unsafe with their students and there are so many ways that teachers can say things which are damaging humiliating actually hurt bodies mm. there are so many ways that um, they can cause injuries mentally and emotionally and physically to their students and there are so many ways which the injury might be in um, less overt, but just as damaging constant effects like the sort of the normalization of this sort of skinny yoga body by this sort of whitewashing of yoga. That's incredibly damaging mm. to so many people. And yeah, and it's, it's an Indian practice, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you yeah. wouldn't know if you looked at Instagram, you wouldn't know that. You'd think it was for a very for twenty year old, very bendy, um, beautiful white women in bikinis. Yeah, you can only practice it if you're wearing a bikini and you're doing a headstand on a beach in a sunset. But mm. that's the way that yoga companies, if we're talking back about business, mm. um, I the. I, there was, I set up Movement for Modern Life at the same time as a very shrewd person who was setting up another yoga business. And that person decided that the way that they were going to spread their yoga business was in disseminating pictures. It was a conscious decision in um, disseminating the images and partnering up with the teachers who have the biggest Instagram accounts, which happened to be those people who we've mentioned. And that was a very shrewd business move. You can't fault it. If your aim in life is to make money from yoga, that is how to do it. If that's your aim. Sad, isn't it? It's, yeah, I, I, as this sort of letting your words sink in, it's, it's just, I feel my insides go, Ugh. It's, it's disgusting, really, isn't it? And I've seen that, you know, with Movement for Modern Life in the last eight years. And it's a very, very conscious decision that I've taken that I'm never going to, I will always try, let's put it the other way around, I will always try as hard as I can to make us all feel welcome within whatever body we have. Mm. Because that's yoga. Mm. <laughs> That's what it is. We have to be welcome at home within our bodies. Mm. We have to. That's so the for, for people who are marginalized, either because of their color or mm -hmm. income or, mm -hmm. or whatever's happening in their lives. It's it's a big it's a big deal to go to yeah. a club. It's a massive deal because the bikini headstand yeah. white girl thing is so prevalent. And it'll the, make everybody who is not that person feel shit yeah it's a weird world that we live in <laughs> that like all of the people who aren't that person which is let's face it like 99.99999 percent like the rest of us are made to feel shitty by one image of one person who doesn't represent anybody mm human mind it's crazy mm. 
And it's like, and that's the shitty side of the yoga business, in my opinion. That's the bit I can't stand. It's that sort of Instagrammable, instant quick fix. It's the yoga websites with all the, you know, if, if you see them, they when they film live classes, it's the hotties at the front. <laughs> put the hotties at the front and you know the rest of us just get sort of shoved in the back and it's just horrendous and I mean to be fair that's no different to any other advertising world but the yoga world should be different our standards well, we've, yeah, I love this conversation because it's like it's like we're doing figures of eight here because we're back we're, yeah. back, we're back where we started at, at yeah. this intersection between spirit and business Mm -hmm. yeah and how very uncomfortable that is and it always has been any spiritual movement is going to guaranteed have problems around money yeah and it's like something which is is yoga inherently a sort of socialist everybody is welcome model and in a way I think well yeah it is because yeah right yoga is unity right I mean it's yoga it's unity it's we're all here together. I'm here, the whole of me, with the whole of you, with the whole of the universe. We are all, like that is yoga to, to me anyway. So it's like, well, that's not about, that's not about this is for some people, this is not for others. That, I mean, that's just the opposite of what yoga is. So you're absolutely right. It's like, is that an inherently unyogic thing? And then, and then, I sort of have some other thoughts which are like, well, if you're able to grow in a sustainable way, is that yoga? Maybe a little bit more. If you share, is that yoga? Maybe. Maybe if it's if you make people feel a bit better, then that's maybe a bit more yoga. But yeah, it's something that I'm thinking about. And I think about on a daily basis because I get caught in these, you know, running a yoga business is horrible. Can you say that again in your funny voice, Kat? Yeah. <laughs> running a yoga business. That's my business, lady. That's my business. That's, a, that's the voice that I wear when I wear my pinstripe suit when I go into my office every day. Have you, have you ever met a bank manager? You'd have to run I'm, a yoga business. I am running a yoga business now. Um, Whereas actually I run, I mostly do it in my pajamas in my front room. <laughs> yeah, um, as we all do, right? Um, so it's like that thing of running a yoga business, I would make very different decisions to the real decisions that I do decide to make because I think that success for Movement for Modern Life isn't about profit. And that's weird and sh weird in our little universe um because in our sort of world we are all meant to grow exponentially like all businesses are meant to grow that's the deal like and then it's like well okay if we're not here to grow what are we here for well just to be sustainable to support people to talk about something that needs to be talked about is it like making money no matter what? No, that's not the thing. Because if you would, for me, I think, well, if I was doing that, I might as well just go off and, you know, do something that really will make me some money, like become a bank robber or, you know. <laughs> You'd be a rubbish bank robber. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> but, you know, that's not the reason why I gave up my career in the law. <laughs> there goes another voice. I was a legal professional in order to run this. It's not to make money. It's about doing something. It's about sharing something more important. So it's like, what is the point of business? Is the point of business to make money? And maybe we just need to redefine what business is. Mm -hmm. And if we can redefine what business is, then maybe it can be a bit more spiritual. Mm -hmm. If, if, we're not, if we're not putting the profit motive above other things, but, that, but that's a luxury because I don't have shareholders to answer to. 
Because if you've got those people breathing down your back and they're saying, oh, if you get this Instagram lady, you'll automatically get 2 million followers, which will bring along. And it does. That is how to make money. They're not wrong. Not something I'm interested in, though. I'd much rather work with Norman and Uma. <laughs> so success, how, how do you define success for your personally for yourself? You've talked about movement for modern life, but what about you? What does that, how do you think about and quantify that within yourself? Uh, good question. I like that question because it is something that I think about. And I think it's knowing that you're sharing something that comes from my heart and that I wholeheartedly believe in that it's something that I think that I, I know my mum does it like, and it makes her feel better. And I know that I've contributed to her health and her well-being by doing what I do. I've, I've done a good thing because mum is doing things which really, really do help her. And it's sharing something that um, it's accessible. And I think about my mum because it's like, she's not a yogi. She'd never have gone into a yoga studio. That's not her. But she is somebody, she started yoga age 70. And she now has less osteoporosis, less back pain. She also has learned a lot of yoga philosophy, which has helped her. Because I think the yoga philosophy does help us all. We learn how to surrender. We learn how to let things go. And that's so important because our society is so about clinging on and working to that goal and attainment and achievement, making the most of ourselves. And I think being a yogi is such a comforting thing because we learn that, yeah, we're okay in our little way. Mm. And we're okay just connecting with other people. And we're okay changing our world and changing the world of the people around us. So yeah, so that's success for me is knowing that my mom is happier and healthier. And it's also making a living that's sustainable and knowing that, because for me, sustainability is core. It's like, because that's the opposite of capitalism really, isn't it? Because capitalism is all about let's, you know, it was the start of it was like, well, we need slaves to make it work. Well, no, it's about giving everybody a slice of cake and making it a delicious cake that everybody wants. So making a living that's sustainable, I think that is a, that would be a, <laughs> a kind of global statement that I think most people would be able to agree with because the sustainability needs to be personal we have yeah. to be using our own energy and intelligently yeah so that we don't burn Absolutely. out and it's that thing of burnout isn't it which is this crazy thing which is i'm going to make so much money now so that later i don't have to worry well you get burnout mm -hmm. and that's not real it's not real it's illusion mm -hmm. it's but i think i think that it's not it's and it's it's about the the soup <laughs> the, the cultural soup that we swim in mm -hmm. is that we have to struggle that when we're struggling do we have to struggle to earn earn our living that's the message isn't it and it's like if it's almost like living an easeful life is something to be ashamed of. We should all say when we meet each other, I'm really busy. I'm doing this, this and this. Life is terrible because da 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 da. Mm -hmm. Not, yeah, I'm, I'm living as easeful a life as I possibly can, given our, <laughs> given global warming <laughs> and all the rest of the... Yeah, uh, or there are pockets of ease. Pocket, yeah, right. That's, I mean, that's all we can find, really. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it, part of it, and part of, again, the definition of success is as well, is working with people who you love and being proud and grateful for and respecting your colleagues and learning from them. Because we all spend a lot of time at work, no matter what we do. Mm -hmm. I say, if we can learn and be proud and 
I'm not, God, the amount that I get to learn and the, every single day, I'm just on this incredible journey of learning from the people who I'm surrounded by. And for me, that's just got to be a successful life because mm. it's life where I know that I'm, I'm working towards my little goals of understanding, mm. of being a better human, of trying just trying to human in a sort of more graceful way. Mm. And that's what my colleagues and teachers teach me. It's... And that, I think, is taking yoga off the mat, isn't it? It's, it's taking that inquiry into, what the bloody hell's going on with my back? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> They're going, oh, that's not very kind. Uh, okay, so how can I rein it back a bit? Hmm, that feels kinder. So what do I need here? And it's that sort of little kind of, it goes, oh, fuck. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 like, oh, better. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. It's kind of taking that into the world. And it's a, that's exactly right. It's like a listening. It's learning to listen. Yeah. Listen to your back. What does your back say? That's the start. And then you'll learn, you know, what other people are saying. And then what you, what your sort of what your soul is saying mm. you know like those amazing athletes who've just um who've just had the strength to pull out yeah right i mean that's yoga that's yoga off the mat right there that's how it should be mm. it's just that inner strength of saying you know what your definition no -uh, not my definition i'm i'm not choosing to have the same success goals that you choose mm. i'm gonna live I'm going to be brave and live my own path, walk my own walk, listen to my own heart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To close up the conversation, Kat, I, can you give me your tippiest top tip for a happy inside life, please? People I, think, I think that from everything <laughs> that we've said, it's got to be about listening to ourselves listening to our heart because our heart is our biggest teacher that we have and it's not anybody else's definition it's not society's it's not the money it's not the goal it's not the outfit it's our heart and I think often our society is so noisy we don't know what our heart is saying which is why we practice yoga nidra, meditation, quiet practices of yoga to still our minds and listen to our hearts. Yeah, just let's live a heartfelt, heart-led life. Mm -hmm. mm. If you're a yoga teacher, what do you think about the money aspect, the way that you're paid? Are you paid enough? Can you make a living? And if you're a, a student, a yoga student, how much do you think is fair to pay for your classes? And how is the teaching valued? Should the training schools go on training more and more people? I'd love to know what you think. Just hop over to Instagram where you can find me at Kate underscore Codrington and I'd love to hear your thoughts. You can find Kat at movementformodernlife.com. You can try it out for free. And there's open access if you work for the NHS. And if this is your bag, then you might also enjoy the interview with Angela Farmer, which you can find, I don't know what episode it is, I've forgotten now. But there are also loads of interviews with uh, John Sturck and Catherine Annis and loads of other fascinating yoga teachers and not a downward dog between them. I would be so chuffed if you felt able to share this with your class and colleagues. And if you felt like leaving a review, then I'd just be tickled pink. I'll see you very soon for another episode.